we're happy to have David Wallace Wells here for his new book, The Uninhabitable Earth. Some of you may have read Wallace Wells' article with that same title a few years ago in New York Magazine, where he serves as deputy editor. Since then, he has become something of a household name with regards to climate literature, though not many people writing on climate change get compared to Stephen King like he does. Um, his columns have taken up the same themes that his new book does, namely, takes an unsparing look at the rampant effects of climate change that have been caused just in the past few decades, hardly the long-term carbon emissions resultant of a centuries-long process of industrialization as previously believed. The new book offers a panoramic view of climate catastrophes. Drawing on the present-day events we have all become eerily accustomed to, Wallace Wells outlines potential futures that seem almost unimaginable. We find out about windstorms, massive fires, heat waves, floodings, and mudslides that'll hit us to give a condensed list, although to blandly itemize these disasters gives no justice to their impact. Hence, Wallace Wells predicts climate changes on a Celsius degree by degree level, allowing the reader to see the reach and terror climate change has already caused and will continue to do. The second half of the book, which I think is a really different and interesting thing that he's done uh, takes up the process of normalization that will incur as climate change strengthens its grip. Wallace Wells highlights the ways in which popular culture will assimilate climate change as an ambient backdrop, potentially unstated, just a thing that's there that we all live with. Critics have commented on the scope of horror with which he writes about climate change. Yet coming away from this book, one leaves with the feeling that other writers haven't quite expressed the scale and magnitude of what's to come. Luckily, we have him here with us tonight to ex explain further, and let's welcome him to Politics and Prose. I just learned a few minutes ago that I'm supposed to give a spiel, which I didn't prepare, so forgive me for improving this, but um, since I imagine that we'll be talking a bit in the Q&A about climate change and the science and what that means for all the ways that all the, you know, all the ways we live on the planet today. Um, I thought I could, in talking to you, just talk a little bit about how I came to this subject, which is um, a bit of an unusual story. I'm not an environmentalist. I'm somebody who um, has lived his entire life in New York City and felt until quite recently that that meant I was living outside of nature that nature was something that happened elsewhere and that climate change, while something that I knew to be worried about and knew to list on a um, lineup of concerns about the future, was also something that I felt wasn't likely to affect me or those who I loved. Um, and so I'm a kind of unusual um, climate thinker, writer, figure, person, activist type. Um, because I don't think of myself as a climate person. I think of myself as a journalist. And I've always been a journalist who was interested in the near future of science and technology. And a few years ago, um, I just started seeing much more news um, about climate change coming out. And that news was much scarier than I was seeing it being reported in many of the places I considered um, kind of rivals. I work at New York Magazine and the newspapers and magazines that we think of as our competitors. When they did climate storytelling, it felt um, quite cautious and earnest and reluctant to consider some real scary scenarios, even as those scenarios were being published in the best scientific journals and being put forward by the most um, status scientists working on this, on this subject. And I looked around and I felt that, you know, thinking backwards over the way that climate had been told and talked about for a generation, that there had been sort of three storytelling mistakes that were made that led to three major misapprehensions about climate change among even people like me, which is to say people who were you know, mindful of the issue, but not um, really concerned about it. Those misapprehensions were the first was about the speed of change. I at least felt that I had been led to believe that climate change was a very slow phenomenon, mm 
that it was something that was going to arrive on a timescale of decades at the fastest and probably more like centuries. So that if I was worrying about climate, it might be worrying about my grandchildren's lives, not about my own, not about even the lives of my children. In fact, half of all of the emissions that have been put into the atmosphere from the burning of fossil fuels have been put there over the last 30 years, which is since Al Gore published his first book on climate change. It's since the UN established its IPCC panel on climate change. In the book, I say it's since um, the premiere of Seinfeld. This is a story that I, as a 36 year old, I know that whole story 30 years ago. The planet, the planet's climate was relatively stable. It would, there were reasons for concern in the long term, but things were relatively stable. 30 years later, we are on the brink of some really catastrophic possibilities. And that narrative I watched happen and watched it happen in part in my own name as a kind of wealthy figure, a, a figure in the wealthy West. Um, for whom much industrialization was done. Um, the speed of change is the first big misapprehension. The second is about the scope of change. I felt 10 years ago that um, I knew a lot about sea level rise and what Arctic melt would mean for our coastlines. But that led me to believe that for, you know, for me, as with anyone else, if I lived off the coastlines, I would be safe that climate change would redraw the map of the world, but it would be a matter of redrawing it, you know, at most several hundred yards inland from the coasts that we know today. The more I spend time with the new science and the more that new science was done in areas ranging from agriculture, where the track we're on um, with carbon emissions is likely to cut in half grain yields by the end of the century. So we'll have half as productive agriculture to feed perhaps 50% more people to economics, which suggests that if we stay on the track that we're on with climate change, we'll have a global GDP that's at least 20% smaller and perhaps 30% smaller than it would be without climate change. That's an impact that's twice as big as the Great Depression, and it would be permanent um, to conflict. Conflict doubles I'm sorry, conflict um, is increased at a rate of between 10 and 20% for every half degree of warming, which means if we stay on the trajectory we're on by the end of the century, we will have twice as much war as we have today and possibly more. Um, and there are many other areas like this where there is new research suggesting that climate is not a localized threat about the shoreline, but an all-encompassing issue. It's a total system which we all live within no matter how much we think of ourselves as urbanites protected from the forces of climate change, no matter how much we think that wealth can protect us, um, it will be everywhere. And I think it will not leave any aspect of life unchanged over the coming century. In most cases, I would say deformed, not just changed. So that's the second thing, the scope, it's everywhere. And the third thing is the severity. Um, scientists have long talked about two degrees Celsius of warming as the, what's called the threshold of catastrophe. And that meant that to a lay reader engaging with this subject in newspapers and on the nightly news, you could really believe that two degrees was something like, um, the worst case scenario, basically a ceiling for how bad things could get. I think it's now basically conventional wisdom among people who really know climate that using only what's called conventional decarbonization, which is um, replacing dirty energy with clean energy, that two degrees is really a floor of warming, that it is not a worst case scenario, but a best case scenario. And we're on track by the end of the century to warm by about four or even more than four degrees Celsius. And that range of outcomes, two degrees to four degrees, I felt had really, really not been explained to the public or illustrated in any vivid way. And I felt as a journalist, as a storyteller, a kind of direct excitement, exhilaration at the scale of this story that I felt had not been properly told. It was everywhere. It was bigger than anyone had been told. It was all encompassing. It would affect everything. And yet nobody was 
I felt writing about it in those terms. I shouldn't say nobody. There are a lot of climate writers whose work I really admire. Um, Bill McKibben, Betsy Colbert, um, to name two. But the kind of conventional understanding that people like me had from casually, occasionally reading newspaper articles about it, casually processing TV news reports about it, was limited in those three ways in a really, really, to a really, really profound degree. And I set about telling the story as I saw it, that it was happening faster, that it was much bigger um, and more all encompassing than we thought. And it was likely to be much worse than we had been told. Um, and the result is this book, which um, walks through the science of warming. I think it's a, um, a kind of summary is an unsexy word for it, but a, basically a summary of um, our understanding from the new science of what sea level to ex sea level rise to expect, what agricultural problems to expect, what public health impacts to expect, you know, economics, violence, all the stuff that I've mentioned already. But it also, in its second half, um, tries to take a few steps beyond that and address the question of what it will mean for all of us and the way that we live and relate to one another here um, to be living on a world that is degraded in all of these ways, where resource scarcity is a bigger issue than it is today, where climate refugees could number, the UN says that the UN's low end estimate for the number of climate refugees by 2050 is 200 million. Their high end estimate is 1 billion, which is as many people as live in North and South America combined today. And I think those numbers are a little too high. I think they've been produced by people who are sort of incentivized to create alarm about refugees. But um, the fact that they are even being floated by the UN should tell you a lot about the scale of this problem and what is likely to happen if we don't change course very, very soon. Um, you look at, you know, the Syrian civil war, complicated story to tell, but um, climate was definitely a factor in producing it. It produced a drought, which produced a famine, which was one of the causes of that civil war. That, that civil war produced 1 million refugees who went to Europe. There were about 12 million in total, but most of them stayed closer to home. 1 million refugees moving to the European continent completely destabilized European politics. And I think through that global geopolitics, I think you probably wouldn't have seen Brexit without um, the Syrian refugee crisis. You may not have even seen the election of Donald Trump without it. Um, and that is 1 million refugees. And the UN says we're going to see at least 200 times as many in the next few decades. Um, you start to think about what that will mean for our politics, a politics that's already retreating from the kind of liberal cosmopolitan international order that we grew to take for granted in the aftermath of the Cold War, especially what it will mean for the way we think about history and whether we take for granted the idea that the future will be more prosperous and more healthy than the past, um, how it will change our relationship to technology what we think technology is to blame for, what we think technology owes us, what we think it can distract us from, um, and the same for capitalism. I think these are forces, the, climate the force of climate change is so large, there is no aspect of modern life that will be untouched by it. And I think we will come to understand this century that we're walking into now as a century defined by climate change in much the same way that say the late 19th century was defined by modernity or by industry. The late 20th century was defined by financial capitalism. That is how big a story climate change is. And we're walking into that story. We're going to be playing roles in that, in that story um, without yet having really reckoned with just how different our lives will be under the sign of warming. Um, what I'm trying to do in the book is sketch out some tentative thoughts about what life will be like. I'm not trying to make um, prophecies or explicit predictions um, in part because I think it's really hard to know how, given how much will be transformed, what the outcome will be like. Um, but I do think that while I, I believe that even at four degrees, even at five degrees of warming, civilization will endure, humans will endure, and in fact, many people will find ways to live what they feel are fulfilling, prosperous lives. Looking at that world from the vantage of today, we would say this is an unconscionable future. 
we must do something about it very quickly to avoid it. And I hope that um, our politics is changing quickly enough to make that happen. Although as quickly as it is moving on climate, I'm afraid it's probably not fast enough. Um, so that's my spiel. Um, maybe I'll do a little, um, a quick little reading and then we can move on to questions. Um, and apologies if in this reading, I say some of the things I just said, but, uh, I'll try to move through it quickly. I'll just read a couple pages. It is worse, much worse than you think. The slowness of climate change is a fairy tale, perhaps as pernicious as the one that says it isn't happening at all, and comes to us bundled with several others in an anthology of comforting delusions. That global warming is an Arctic saga unfolding remotely. That it is strictly a matter of sea level and coastlines, not an enveloping crisis sparing no place and leaving no life undeformed. That it is a crisis of the natural world, not the human one. That those two are distinct and that we live today somehow outside or beyond or at the very least defended against nature not inescapably within and literally overwhelmed by it. That wealth can be a shield against the ravages of warming. That the burning of fossil fuels is the price of continued economic growth. That growth and the technology it produces will allow us to engineer our way out of environmental disaster. That there is any analog to the scale or scope of this threat in the long span of human history that might give us confidence in staring it down. None of this is true. But let's begin with the speed of change. The Earth has experienced five mass extinctions before the one we are living through now, each so complete a wiping of the fossil record that it functioned as an evolutionary reset. The planet's phylogenetic tree first expanding, then collapsing at intervals like a lung. 86% of all species dead 450 million years ago. 70 million years later, 75%. 125 million years later, 96%. 50 million years later, 80%. 135 million years after that, 75% again. Unless you are a teenager, you probably read in your high school textbooks that these extinctions were the result of asteroids. In fact, all but the one that killed the dinosaurs involved climate change produced by greenhouse gas. The most notorious was 250 million years ago. It began when carbon dioxide warmed the planet by five degrees Celsius, accelerated when that warming triggered the release of methane, another greenhouse gas, and ended with all but a sliver of life on earth dead. We are currently adding carbon to the atmosphere at a considerably faster rate. By most estimates, at least 10 times faster. The rate is 100 times faster than at any point in human history before the beginning of industrialization. And there is already, right now, fully a third more carbon in the atmosphere than at any point in the last 800,000 years perhaps in as long as 15 million years. There were no humans then. The oceans were more than 100 feet higher. Um, <clears throat> Many perceive global warming as a sort of moral and economic debt accumulated since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution and now come due after several centuries. In fact, as I said before, more than half of the carbon exhaled into the atmosphere by the burning of fossil fuels has been emitted in just the past three decades. The United Nations established its climate change framework in 1992, advertising, sci advertising scientific consensus unmistakably to the world. This means we have now engineered as much ruin, knowingly, as we ever managed in ignorance. Global warming may seem like a distended morality tale playing out over several centuries 
and inflicting a kind of Old Testament retribution on the great-great-grandchildren of those responsible, since it was carbon burning in 18th century England that lit the fuse of everything that has followed. But that is a fable about historical villainy that acquits those of us alive today, and unfairly. The majority of the burning has come since the premiere of Seinfeld. Since the end of World War II, the figure is about 85%. The story of the industrial world's kamikaze mission is the story of a single lifetime, the planet brought from seeming stability to the brink of catastrophe in the years between a baptism or bar mitzvah and a funeral. We all know those lifetimes. When my father was born in 1938, among his first memories, the news of Pearl Harbor and the mythic Air Force of the industrial propaganda films that followed, the climate system appeared to most human observers steady. By the time my father died in 2016, weeks after the desperate signing of the Paris Agreement, the climate system was tipping towards devastation, passing the threshold of carbon concentration, 400 parts per million in the Earth's atmosphere, in the eerily banal language of climatology, that had been, for years, the bright red line environmental scientists had drawn in the rampaging face of modern industry, saying, do not cross. Of course, we kept going. Just two years later, we hit a monthly average of 411, and guilt saturates the planet's air as much as carbon, though we choose to believe we, <clears throat> we do not breathe it. The single lifetime is also the lifetime of my mother. Born, born in 1945 to German Jews fleeing the smokestacks through which their relatives were incinerated, and now enjoying her 73rd year in an American commodity paradise, a paradise supported by the factories of a developing world that has, in the space of a single lifetime too, manufactured its way into the global middle class with all the consumer enticements and fossil fuel privileges that come with that ascent. Electricity, private cars, air travel, red meat. She has been smoking for 58 of those years, unfiltered, ordering the car... The or ordering the cigarettes now by the carton from China. It is also the lifetime of many of the scientists who first raised public alarm about climate change, some of whom incredibly remain working. That is how rapidly we have arrived at this promontory. In the 1970s, many of those scientists did research with funding from Exxon, a company now the target of a raft of lawsuits that aim to adjudicate responsibility for the rolling emissions regime that today, barring a change of course on fossil fuels, threatens to make parts of the planet more or less unlivable for humans by the end of this century. That is the course we are speeding so blithely along, to more than four degrees Celsius of warming by the year 2100. According to some estimates, that would mean that whole regions of Africa and Australia and the United States, parts of South America, north of Patagonia, and Asia, south of Siberia, would be rendered uninhabitable by direct heat, desertification, and flooding. Certainly, it would make them inhospitable, and many more regions besides. This is our itinerary, our baseline, which means that if the planet was brought to the brink of climate catastrophe within the lifetime of a single generation, the responsibility to avoid it be belongs with a single generation too. We all also know that second lifetime. It is ours. That's my reading. So, um, yeah, I think um, maybe we'll do some questions now. So whatever anyone would like to ask. So uh, I'm not sure what to ask after that reading and your uh, preliminary words. I guess my question is, um, what is the psychology behind our refusal to do more? What, what is it about human beings that keeps us from looking at reality and acting rationally? 
Well, I think it's a it's a really naughty problem. The people who study this say call it a call it a wicked problem. Um, there are answers at the political level, at the international level, at the individual level, and all of those are important. Um, you know, my own interest is in mostly in the at the level of the individual, um, and on on that point, I would say. Um, there are a whole set of psychological reflexes and biases that make us want to believe the future will be brighter, that um, give us falsely optimistic um, ideas about the future. I think some of those are um, essentially, you know, we've evolved because those um, biases benefit us and some of them have been taught to us through our culture, um, but they are really pervasive. And I think hardly anyone is um, immune to their forces. I'm somebody who has spent now several years really buried in this quite bleak science. And when I imagine the end of my life, when I imagine my daughter's life, I'm not imagining a climate hellscape. I'm imagining a world much like the one that I see, that I grew up in. Um, because in addition to all the biases that we have, we also anchor our expectations for the future every time we walk down the street every time we look out the window. And today's climate is unsustainable given our um, emissions uh, system. Um, it will be hotter than this. It will definitely be hotter than this. And that will cause a lot of problems. Even if we take some really radical action, it will cause a lot of problems. And yet every day we're reminded of the world, the present climate and um, sort of uh, make use of the present climate as a baseline for expectations for the future. I think that's really a problem. And that's one of the reasons that in the book, I try to establish the track we're on four degrees of warming as a more reasonable baseline against which to judge our own action. Because if we're hoping to restore, to stabilize and make permanent today's climate, which is about 1.1 degrees warmer than the pre-industrial baseline, there's no hope of that. Um, if we want to, count victories and make progress, um, I think we have to measure that progress against the baseline of four degrees. Um, at the political level, you know, in America, there's a huge, you know, there, um, set of interests that are um, aligned with, uh, aligned against action on climate. There's a lot of money that funds that inaction. One of our two parties has been essentially bought by that money. Um, but I actually think that that story is a little overstated by most Americans because when you look around the world, denial is really not a problem anywhere else. There's a little bit of it in the UK, there's a little bit of it in Russia, but basically it's an American problem and nowhere else in the world is anybody doing much better when it comes to carbon than we are. So to blame climate denial or even the abhorrent villainous behavior of the Republican Party on climate um, for the fate of the world's climate is I think a little narcissistic and it's a little wishful thinking in the sense of finding convenient villains. Um, at the geopolitical level, um, there's a huge collective action problem. Even if every country in the world was completely committed to fast action on carbon, carbon in principle, they would have an individual incentive to slow walk that action and to let the rest of the world clean up the mess. And I think that's one of the reasons that the Paris Accords are, I think you'd have to say at this early stage, a failure. No major industrial nation in the world is on track to honor its commitments under Paris. And even if we did honor all of them, we'd still end up north of three degrees. Um, so we need to do considerably better than these commitments, which no nation in the world is honoring. I think that's because there's a really complicated incentive system um, that makes it appealing to nations to uh, effectively um, retreat from their pledges. And I think that is actually the kind of, personally, I think that's how Trump sees um, the issue too. I don't think he's really a hard denier. I think he just thinks that there is a kind of advantage in doing less and letting the rest of the world do more. Um, but that there are all of these blocks against action at every level is just, a, it's a sign of how difficult the problem is. It's also a sign of just how big it is. There's almost no human impulse, I think, that is in, untouched or unaffected by climate change in some way. And unfortunately, there are a lot of human impulses that are making it harder for us to act. Um, I don't think there's any, any one that explains it all. I think it's a kind of whole ecosystem of wishful thinking, bias, self-interest. Um, and 
compartmentalization. You know, I, I mentioned in the book, there's a one really remarkable study um, showing that the impact just from the deaths of air pollution um, between the threshold of 1.5 degrees and 2 degrees, just that half degree of thresh of w extra warming, would um, kill 153 million people just from air pollution. So that's not counting any other climate effects. 153 million. That's the size of 25 holocausts. And when I say that to people, their eyes light up and they go ashen. It seems an unconscionable level of suffering, which it is, right? But 9 million people are dying every year already from air pollution. That's a Holocaust every year. And we are not paying attention to that in New York and D.C. in the way that we would like to. So I think that form of compartmentalization is a huge problem, too. I suspect it will be a bigger problem going forward as climate suffering intensifies I think people who are in the relatively well-off, relatively unaffected parts of the world will find ways to look away, will invent new forms of looking away. And I hope that isn't the case, but I, I worry about that a lot. Uh, hi. Uh, I'm a, uh, a writer on climate and a bit of a climate activist. I have a similar question, but um, focus more locally. And um, I'm part of a group called the Climate Mobilization. And coincidentally, I just got an email an hour ago saying that our founder is going to be on a program with you on Tomorrow night, right? climate. Yeah. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yes. Uh, um, and um, so say hello to, to, to her for me. But so um, I live in Montgomery County, which is just an hour, a half hour's walk up the street here. A million people, very sophisticated, very rich, as you would expect, being a suburb of Washington. And a couple of us, to our amazement, got the county last year or 15 months ago to pass a resolution nine to zero to declare the first climate emergency in the country and to commit to decarbonizing in a decade or, or a little after that. Amazing. What have they done since? Essentially nothing. As I describe it, it's, I think, the, the climate, uh, it's, it's an emergency proclamation that's got the least publicity of any emergency uh, proclamation in human history. And, um, and you know, we've tried everything. We've sent them 20-page memos, do this, and, and uh, demonstrate it in front of them and whatever. So I guess, Mike, it's more just sort of like help <laughs> whether you have any additional observations or, or well, folks who want to talk to me afterwards about that. There are a couple of things I think are sort of hope giving on this point, um, not to say that they should give us an overall hopeful picture of the future of climate action. But um, recently there have been a whole raft of lawsuits globally um, on this issue in the Netherlands. Um, a group of citizens sued the Dutch government, which had not been honoring its Paris commitments, and won a judgment forcing the government to take much faster action on climate. Um, in the U.S., there's a kind of notable lawsuit that's gotten a lot of press called Juliana versus the United States, which is notable in part because it was brought by a bunch of teenagers, um, and it uses a really novel interpretation of the um, Equal Protection Clause. The claim is basically that um, by imposing climate impacts um, on future generations that were not imposed on previous generations. They are violating the equal rights of today's children. Um, that's a district court right now. I suspect it will win there because it's in Oregon, which is a quite liberal district. I suspect it won't win at the Supreme Court um, if it advances that far. But if it did, it would, it would actually require a completely radical um, transformation of um, American policy on this issue because it's literally impossible if, if, that, if that equal um, Equal Protection Clause principle is upheld, it's literally impossible to honor it because today's children will be impacted by climate in ways that their parents wouldn't. So the government would have to do sort of maximal climate action to even make a show of good faith on that issue. And I suspect around the world there will be actions like that through litigation. Um, but I also think that the, um, the inaction of governments at every level, local, state, national, international, um, has been for a long time crippled by economic thinking that held that um, the cost of climate action, that climate action would be very expensive, both in the sense of requiring upfront investment and in the sense of foregoing economic growth. But all of the new research over the last few years shows that in part because climate change will be much more expensive than we expected, that actually fast action will be, um, makes economic sense that we can add significant wealth to our economies in relatively short order and that the payoffs are, will be coming so quickly that they won't really be um, seen as, um, you know, 
money, sending money towards a humanitarian cause. It will be a direct economic investment. There was one major report in 2018 suggesting that globally we could add $26 trillion to the world's economy by just 2030. That's a lot of money. I think the projection may be a little rosy, but um, generally speaking, the conventional wisdom of economists on this issue has changed dramatically over just the last few years. And I think that because that, that old economic thinking was so important to policymakers and making them want to act more slowly, I think the new um, thinking could really change things in that respect. And I do think things are changing. The problem is if we really need to have carbon emissions by 2030, as the UN says we do, there was a new paper today in Nature saying that we need to zero out carbon by 2030, which I think is literally impossible to do um, to avoid catastrophic warming. These are not timelines that accommodate any kind of delay. Um, exactly. The UN Secretary General says, well, the UN, the IPCC said we needed a World War II scale mobilization against climate. Um, and the UN Secretary General said we needed to start that this year, 2019. So I think we all know from our politics that um, that's not happening this year. In the U.S., it's not happening this year anywhere in the world. Um, but, you know, I think the, the movement of politics, the Green New Deal, um, huge questions about what that would mean and how we could achieve the goals that are laid out in that legislation. But the fact that the Democratic Party, which is a party that five years ago considered cap and trade too radical, now has all of its major, dem all of its major presidential candidates signing on to um, at least a statement of principles that are this ambitious is on its own terms, by any political science met metric, hugely exciting. It, this is movement on, on a political issue that you hardly ever see. As I say, the problem is that we really don't have that much time. So even this rapid change probably isn't rapid enough. Thanks. I think so, we're doing, uh, yeah, back and forth. Yeah. So I've learned that I'm old enough to be your mother. Uh, All right. I worked at EPA uh, from 1980 to 1986, and it was bad enough so that I completely reinvented myself in a different career. Um, have you thought or have other people thought about a roadmap, what we would need to do to get to where we need to be? I mean, obviously, raising the mileage on cars isn't going to be enough. Uh, insulating our houses isn't going to be enough. I mean, would we have to move? Would we all have to live in a city so that there was more open land? Um, would we have to invent another kind of transportation? Or maybe do everything electronically and stay in one place so that people could work from, you know, the heartland of the country, would give them more jobs, and there'd be less, fewer trains and planes and cars. I mean, has anyone gotten past the sort of macro level and looked at, I mean, I've been told that little things that we do don't do anything. Um, what if you if you were if you were the czar of the world? <laughs> how would you structure the changes that we need to make? Well, I mean, I what would you do first? It's there's no there's no single answer, right? There's no right. one thing to do. Right. It's sort of everything, right. all options. Right. The complicated. The the problem is complicated enough that. It requires thousands, millions of adaptations all around the world. So we think a lot about this in terms of energy. Mm -hmm. um, actually, energy is, I think, about 30% of the global carbon footprint. And it's like the easiest one to solve. That's the easiest part of the problem to solve because green energy is now in most parts of the world cheaper than dirty energy. Mm -hmm. And going forward, projecting forward, it will probably be the case everywhere in the world in short order. Um, some of the other parts of the footprint are much harder to solve. So infrastructure. If cement were a country, it would be the world's third biggest emitter. And China is now pouring as much cement every three years as the U.S. poured in the entire 20th century. Um, it gives off carbon dioxide? The process of making it, yeah. Ah. Um, you know, travel, transportation is a huge problem. Air travel is only 2% of our global carbon footprint, but for people like us, you know, middle class and up Americans, <laughs> it's a much bigger share of our burden. And every round trip ticket um, from coast to coast in the U.S. is the equivalent of eight months of driving. Every round trip ticket from New York to London costs uh, three square meters of Arctic ice. It just every seat on every plane melts three square meters of Arctic ice. And each one of us, we're actually probably 
we, do, we have probably all of us in this room have a bigger carbon footprint than the average American. But the average American every year emits enough carbon to melt 10,000 tons of Arctic ice. Now, there's a lot of ice down there, <laughs> but it's not an infinite amount. Mm -hmm. um, and everything that we do impacts that footprint. So when I turn on the lights in the morning, when I, um, I took an Uber from the train station, um, and each of those impacts, what I eat for dinner, agriculture is about 30% of global, um, global carbon emissions. Each of those um, needs to be addressed independently. And there are very, com aside from energy, there are complex um, systems with many obstacles towards, um, towards zeroing out on carbon. Um, but there are also reasons for optimism. Um, so, you know, there's been a lot of talk about um, diet lately. The Lancet Journal in, the, in England published a big special um, issue about how we can eat more responsibly when it comes to climate. And um, beef is a huge part of that. Beef has a huge carbon right. footprint. Um, but, you know, there are small scale studies that show that if you feed cows um, seaweed, their methane emissions would go down by as much as 95 or 99 percent, which means and you don't even have to feed them exclusively seaweed. It can just be a little slice of their diet. Um, now, I don't know how, sc how scalable that is. I don't know how that beef tastes. But <laughs> theoretically, if right. we just legislated that all cattle farmers had to introduce seaweed into their cow's diet, we could immediately eliminate the entire carbon footprint of beef eating. And, you know, there are nice. solutions like that everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, but the problem is so big that they, it's still hard to get all the way to where we need to go. So in answer to your big question, yeah, I mean, a lot of people have written roadmaps to a, um, a stable climate. Um, probably the one that is most least is least disruptive to the way that mm -hmm. we live. It was is done by this guy, Paul Hawken. It's called Project Drawdown. Um, and it doesn't even require much large scale um, transformation of our economy or industry. Um, I think he's a little bit optimistic about some things, but the, the plans are everywhere. The problem isn't the plans. It's the political will. We just aren't moving such that, you know, green energy, I mentioned earlier, now much cheaper right. Right. than dirty energy in much right. of the world. And that progress has been achieved much more rapidly than even its advocates would have predicted 10 years ago, 15 years ago. A lot of that has to do with the investments that the Obama administration made during the stimulus package. Um, but even so, the globally, the proportion of dirty energy to clean energy has not shrunk in 40 years. So all of that green energy that we've added, we haven't retired any dirty energy. We've just added to our capacity. And that's the problem. We have the techn technological solutions, but we don't have the will to actually use them to reduce our carbon emissions because we want the stuff that carbon can give us. And I say we... I think that's true of just about everybody as individuals on some level. It's also true of our policymakers. Um, and that's the problem. We need to discover a real commitment to this issue that allows us to organize our policy around it as a governing imperative, one that affects no matter what your political goals are, no matter what your ideals are, no matter what, your, um, what you want to get done with politics, climate change will affect those goals. If you care about um, wealth creation, if you care about inequality between nations, in, within nations, if you care about war and conflict, if you care about violence against women, if you care, temperatures raise the, um, r the rates of rape and domestic assault, um, if you care about drought and famine, I mean, everything about, um, you know, the political world that we see and want to change mm -hmm. will be impacted by climate. And I think we need a new politics that puts climate not just front and center, but sort of above all of these issues and organizes them all within the context of the cause of climate, which does, um, as I say, kind of govern all of them. Thank you. Uh, just a quick announcement. We, we can only take a couple more questions. There's, there's almost no way we're getting to all the people who are standing right now. Um, but we'll start with this person here and move to the next and we'll see how many we can fit in by, by the end of the hour. Thanks. Sorry, I'll try to do faster answers too. Okay. Um, I, I think that a roadmap that everybody in this room can participate in um, begins with, and I'm, I, I want to know if you agree with me, pricing carbon. Mm 
letting um, carbon dioxide going into the air be paid for instead of being um, a free garbage dump um, out of our atmosphere. And um, I wanted to know if you are aware that in our Congress right now is a bill which is putting a price on carbon. It's not the green energy um, um, plan to, to, improve, to fix the world. It is a beginning for putting a price on carbon and it's HR 763. It's called Energy Innovation and a Carbon Dividend. And it's got a lot of answers. I just wondered if you were, what's your take I'm, on that? My basic feeling, as I say, is that it, it takes all approaches. I'm less of an enthusiast about carbon taxes than I think you are because the UN says that in order to stay below two degrees of warming, we need carbon taxes possibly as high as $5,500 a ton. There's not an existing carbon tax in the world that's one one hundredth of that. And all of the places that have carbon taxes now, their emissions are still growing. I think that if we, so I think that having a carbon tax that was high enough to really have teeth, it would be so high it was effectively a ban. Um, I think if we had started a couple of decades ago and started small and then grown the tax over time, I think that could have been a really useful tool. But I worry that we're, it's a little bit, you know, too little, too late right now. Um, William Nordhaus, who just won the Nobel Prize, um, in part for his work on carbon taxes and, and the, the climate impacts, the economic impacts of climate change. He, his, what he calls the optimal level of global warming is three and a half degrees. Um, so he, and that's, that's, that would be a world in which um, we would have the permanent loss of all Arctic ice sheets and our Antarctic ice sheets. It would mean hundreds of millions of climate refugees. It would mean cities in the Middle East and South Asia were literally unlivable because of heat as soon as 2050. These are cities that have as many as 10 or 15 million people in them. And I think that, you know, balancing, um, balancing the, what's politically palatable with a carbon tax with the scale of um, decarbonization that we need, I think it's really hard to see that working. Washington state, which is one of the US's greenest, bluest states, just rejected a carbon tax in the midterm in the midst of a blue wave. And I think that there is an ugly kind of nimbyism, um, even among people who are engaged on climate, where they don't really want to pay even that additional dollar or 50 cents per gallon for, for gas. So I think that while, while I would like to see a solution that involves carbon pricing, I would also like that to see that price be set very high. And I have a, you know, a hard time imagining that happening in our, given our present politics and our present culture. Uh, there's a, uh, there's a dividend involved as well. So, I, yeah, I got it. Yeah. I did this, I, I'm not anti-carbon tax, I just think it's not at all a silver bullet solution. It's just at best a part of the solution. Um, hi, I, just on the carb, quick on the carbon tax, I think one of the things that it will in introduce is innovation and it will also help carbon capture and storage be more economical. So I think there's some things that can be done even with a lower rate that, you know, that just are not economically viable under the current circumstances. Um, I didn't come here necessarily to hear you talk. I read your book. It's an amazing book. I came here for all the rest of you uh, because I, I'm assuming that I, I want a, sh a show of hands of who has already read the book. How many people here have already read the book? Okay, then that's good. It's good that most of you are here to get excited about it. But <laughs> for those of you who have read the book, how many, as a result of reading the book, are now all in with carbon change in terms of like or, or climate change being, as, as David said, the top over governing, you know, uh, thing for your agenda. How many people feel that that is what you're concerned about? If you're interested, I'm going to cut my comments short. Uh, talk to me afterwards. I have some ideas I can share. Uh, the other but one thing I will leave you with is, you know, the thing you can do that will also help David is to buy multiple copies of his book and give them to your friends and try to persuade them. <laughs> Thank you. We have time for this question here and this last question over there, and then we'll have to cut it off. Thanks. Hi. Um, I kind of want to push on this idea of convenient villains and also a theme that I noticed throughout the book, which has to do with the, you know, moral responsibility. Who carries moral responsibility for climate change? Is it the we or is it kind of a the global elite? per se, or maybe decision makers who are being complacent. Um, this is, I guess, it seems to me 
through your comments tonight and also in the book that you kind of take a we stance as opposed to these convenient villains of, you know, powerful people who have a personal carbon footprint that's very large, but also are putting policy in place that allow for society at large to have a large carbon footprint. Okay, so do you agree that you kind of take that stance? Is my analysis correct? I think I think that the responsibility is shared by everyone, but shared unequally. So I think that there are um, individuals and also forces in our societies that are bear much more responsibility than others. But I also think that um, it's unhealthy and um, you know irrational to think that any individual living in the modern West bears no responsibility for it. That was it. Okay. Hi. Um, so like you, I'll be 118 in 2100. Uh, so um, I guess, you know, I find your work uh, compelling and realist and also like severely depressing. Uh, but I don't, I don't actually think your point is to make me feel bad. Um, but I find any of the optimism that you've shared during the question and answer period like really unsatisfying. And I find your sort of more depressing things uh, much more realist. And so I guess maybe my question is about whether, uh, whether, whether your point is to make us depressed or if like you specifically, or maybe like even journalism more broadly, cause like you've answered a lot of these questions, uh, like what the role is in terms of this like huge problem that like requires large collective action that like our political and social systems, at least here in the US are like not at all set up to handle. Um, like what's, what's the role for the future for both like journalists and then like the rest of us who are gonna be 100 and 2100? Well, one of the things I try to do in the book is to illustrate that um, climate change is not binary, right? So it's not a matter of whether we stay below this threshold of catastrophe or we get north of there. It's not a matter of like, are we living in a climate hellscape or not? Every tick upward makes a difference. Every tick upward creates more suffering and every tick upward that we can avoid averts some suffering. And that will be the case even if we get to four degrees. Um, it will still be the case at four degrees that the biggest most important input in the climate system is how much carbon humans are putting into it. And I think that should be in a certain way, um, you know, an incitement to perpetual eternal action um, that we should never be giving up because the future could always be darker and bleaker or less dark and less bleak. Um, but I think it's inevitable that we find ourselves, you and I living in a world two or three decades from now that is really damaged by this force and which has a lot more suffering in it than the world that we know today, which already has quite a lot of suffering, especially in the global South. Um, and, you know, the question of whether you relate to that news um, as depressing or dispiriting or exhilarating and empowering, uh, you know, I feel all of those emotions at different times, and I don't think it's um, reasonable to ask anyone to feel only one thing about climate change. It's way too big a story. The challenge to our society is way too grand, and the impacts that it'll have on our lives is, are way too complicated. Um, so my own feeling about what this book can do, I mean, first of all, I wrote it really as a journalist, and my main... I felt my main obligation was to tell the truth about what the science says and then to think a little bit about what that means. Um, <clears throat> and if it's the case that the science is terrifying, which it is, I think that it's important to share that news, whatever its impacts. Um, I would feel a little weird hiding the news. But I also feel personally like I'm somebody who was complacent about climate change and now am not. And that storyline is about panic. It's about me looking at the science, freaking out and wanting to tell everybody I knew about what I had found. And for that reason, among others, I think that, you know, raising the alarm is valuable. I think there are surely people who are on the brink of despair and fatalism about this. And I think that hearing more bad news will probably push some of them into that category. And 
that's not great. We should do whatever we can to make sure people still have some kind of hope. But I also look around and talk to my family, my friends, my colleagues, you know, watch television, watch movies, read books. And um, it seems so obvious to me that complacency is a bigger problem than fatalism. And that um, the value of alarmism, and it's, I think it's a complicated thing to say this book is an alarmist book because I think it is so factual, but for the time being, let's just say that it's alarmist. I think the value of alarmism is that it shakes people's complacency. And like I said, I know that because it, it shook my complacency. But I also know that from political movements generally, people are motivated by fear. They're mobilized by fear, um, especially when they feel it very close to home. And I think we've, um, people who do kind of climate communications and stuff, they learned a lot of bad, um, they learned a lot of bad lessons from the last two or three decades. When they saw people not moving on climate change, they thought, you know, they maybe they thought that like the, the risk of fear and despair was, was bigger than it was. Um, I see a whole generation that was not being, that was not being, um, for whom the information was not being shared directly and honestly. And I think that once you see this as something that is a threat that is really, really close, that is imminent, personal, intimate, immediate, I think that um, it's really much harder to look away. And in a kind of morally grotesque way, I think that the extreme weather that we've seen over the last year or two, particularly the wildfires in California, um, have been really good teachers of our, about our climate future. And even those of us who live very far away from California who are at no risk for, of wildfires, that those images are so powerful because they seem so vivid and immediate. And I think the more people who see the threat of extreme weather, the threat of drought, the threat of heat waves close to their own lives, the fewer of us will be able to um, continue on in complacency and look away. And again, I'm worried that um, as you are, that we won't do it fast enough, that, that those changes won't happen fast enough. Um, but I do think that taking seriously the scariest news is um, in addition to being like truthful, also useful. Um, but that's not to say I think it's the only way to tell the story. I think there are an infinite way, number of ways to tell the story. I just feel as though um, the, sci you know, the scientists and science journalists weren't entirely honest with us um, generally. And um, because of that, I think that a book like this is even more useful because it can uh, fill in that gap. Kind of a good half a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.